This is the Argument Ninja Podcast, episode 25. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Kevin DeLaplante. Last episode, I talked about how my business has been doing, and I said that I would continue to talk about that in the next episode or two. But let me just say for the record, when I say things like that, you should take it with a grain of salt because my track record for forecasting what I'll be doing in future episodes is not very good. And that's because my situation, especially right now, is evolving. And what I need the podcast to do for me, how it connects to other things that I'm doing, can change pretty quickly. And right now, I'm producing a video series on critical thinking and tribalism. And it makes sense for me to use the podcast to expand on that topic. So that's what this episode will be about. I will have more to say about how my business will be changing in 2018. But if you really want a deep dive into these issues, I'll just refer you to the blog post I wrote, which you can find at kevindelaplante.com forward slash 2017 year in review. So on this episode... I'm going to give you the audio of the two videos that I've done on tribalism and wrap that with some additional commentary that's not in that audio. We'll talk about the nature of tribalism and tribal psychology, the dangers of tribalism and polarization, cognitive biases that are connected to our tribal psychology, metacognition and critical thinking, and the idea of collective intelligence. So that's what's on deck. But before we start into that, I would like to share a really nice story that does relate to my business. Toward the end of January, I received an email from a woman named Debbie. I won't share her last name here because she really doesn't want this to be about her or her family who live in Southern Indiana, but here's the email. Dear Kevin, each year for Christmas, my family, husband, two kids and their spouses, take turns choosing a place to make a group donation to in lieu of getting each other presents. It's my husband and my turn this year and I'd like to donate to you. And in brackets, I already am a small Patreon donor. Anyway, although my family would donate however I choose, I was wondering if we could make our donation specific somehow, perhaps some item you would need for your work. Our donation would be $500 at least. Do you have anything that I could tell them our donation would go to specifically? Thanks for all your work, Debbie. Well, I looked at this message on my screen, and it really just destroyed me. I couldn't believe it. I love this idea of a group donation in lieu of Christmas presents. My wife loved the idea too. We both decided we would pay this forward next year. But to be the recipient of such a donation out of the blue is really a remarkable thing. I tear up every time I think about this. Gratitude is one emotion. You certainly feel grateful and thankful. But for me, there's also humility. Humility before an act of generosity that is so unexpected, but also humility at being the beneficiary of an act that you don't deserve. And I I do mean that literally. No one deserves a gift that is an unsolicited act of generosity. Later that day, I was shoveling snow at the end of the driveway that we share with a neighbor, and the plow had gone by and it left a big pile at the end. Normally, we shovel our own respective sides of the driveway. That's been our arrangement. But that night, I shoveled out my neighbor's pile so he wouldn't have to when he got home. And I did that because I felt like I needed to pass on this undeserved thing in some way. After I came in, my son asked me why I did this. And I said, just in passing, one act of undeserved grace deserves another. And then we ended up having a discussion about the concept of grace and what things we did and didn't deserve. Now, No one would mistake me for a religious person, but as a student of religion, I do think that certain traditions have valuable things to say about the human condition. And one of the concepts I've always resonated with in Christianity is the concept of grace, but I give it a secular spin. In Christianity, grace is connected to the imperfection of humanity, which is the condition of our existence. Human beings on our own aren't virtuous enough or wise enough to transcend our sinful nature. Limited beings can't understand what is unlimited. Imperfect beings can't understand perfection. Not only that, our sinful nature can't be overcome by any act of will or effort of our own. 
That's what it means to say that we're all subject to original sin. We're fallen creatures. On our own, we can never find our way back to God. And we can never deserve salvation. We're never entitled to it, no matter how good we try to be. The only path to salvation is through God's grace, which is an act of undeserved generosity. He reveals himself to us, and he grants us a path to salvation, a path to transcending our finite sinful nature, even though we don't deserve it. And even when we accept that grace, we still don't deserve it. We're humbled by it, we're grateful for it, but we're not entitled to it. Now, what's the secular version of this? This is how I read it. The secular version of original sin is that it's impossible for us to ever fully live up to all the values that we recognize that reflect our highest ideals. If you're any kind of pluralist about value, if you think there's more than one kind of intrinsic value in the world, or if you care about more than one kind of value, then optimizing for one value inevitably sacrifices others that we care about. So we're always making choices that involve trading off one kind of value for another, and we can never be fully satisfied with those choices because we always fall short somewhere. As a morally self-aware species, there is something tragic about this condition, feeling driven to do the right thing, and knowing that in one form or another, you will fail to live up to the values that you're striving toward. Now, this may sound pessimistic, but I find that if we accept our fallen nature, our tragic nature, this perspective can be a resource for us. For one, it can be a source of humility. Humility can open our eyes, help us to see more clearly. It can give us insight into ourselves and other people. And Accepting our fallen nature can also be a source of compassion and forgiveness. In the face of weakness and failure, we can have contempt for ourselves or we can have compassion. Contempt is toxic and paralyzing. The only way forward is compassion and forgiveness for ourselves. That's how we keep getting back on our feet after being knocked down over and over. That's how we keep striving for excellence, striving for perfection, even when we know that we'll never attain it. And this acceptance of our fallen nature and the need for compassion and forgiveness can also be a ground for our shared humanity. You may be a stranger to me in many ways, but you and I share this much. You struggle to live a life that has meaning. You struggle to live the values that matter to you, and you will fail just as I fail, just as we all fail. We all have this in common. And when I'm in touch with my own fallen nature and the compassion that I need to extend to myself, I can extend that compassion to you because I see myself in you. In this respect, you and I are members of the same tribe. Now, where does the concept of grace come in? I don't want to say that we're never entitled to certain kinds of treatment. We need a concept of entitlement. It's connected to important values of justice and rights and fairness. But we have to admit that much of the good that we receive in our lives is not entitled. And it's not just random acts of kindness. None of us are entitled to the benefits we receive, nor deserving of the harm as we suffer through the accidental circumstances of our birth, our parentage, our race, our gender, our culture, our genetic makeup. Nor is it clear how to attach praise or blame to our personality traits or our virtues and vices. I'm a person who happens to be very slow to anger. Some people are much quicker to anger. To the extent that being slow to anger is a virtue, I'm happy for it. But I can't really say that I deserve to be praised for it. It's just the way I'm wired. So if we don't deserve most of the goods that we receive in our lives or the talents that we enjoy, what's the right attitude to take when we contemplate this dimension of our lives? The Stoics and the Buddhists have a line on this that I like, but I also find that I'm attracted to this picture that I've been sketching, which if you wanted to attach some labels to it, is kind of a secularized Christian existentialism. When I contemplate the good things in my life, I grant that everything could have turned out differently and that fundamentally I'm not deserving of any of this. What I am is grateful 
for the moments of undeserved grace that I've been given. So, Debbie, if you're listening, let me extend another thank you to you and your family for your act of generosity. It made me reflect on some of these themes, so I thought I'd share them here. And just so you all know, within a couple of days, I received $800 in my PayPal account. And I used it to buy an iPad Pro, which I've wanted to get for years, but just couldn't justify the expense when you're struggling just to pay your basic bills every month. My old tablet had died some time ago, but I used to use it all the time for work. And this new tablet is fabulous. And when I'm using it, I'm reminded of the gift of grace. And it's a good feeling. Okay, enough of that digression. The title of this episode is Why Tribal Literacy? So let's talk about this. If you're a Patreon subscriber or you're on my email list, then you know I started a new public video series on tribalism and critical thinking that is intended to present in an accessible way what I consider to be essential components of what I would call tribal literacy. As of this recording, I've posted two videos, one called The Dangers of Tribalism and another called Our Tribal Intelligence. You can find those at kevindolplant.com or just search for Kevin Dolplant in YouTube to find my channel there. And I'll embed those videos in the show notes for this podcast episode too. So why tribal literacy? Well, we seem to be having a tribal moment in our popular consciousness. I can't get through a day without seeing an article or a podcast or a book pop up on my radar that mentions tribalism in one form or another. Here are the titles of some news articles. The Retreat to Tribalism. Can Our Democracy Survive Tribalism? Two Threats to World Peace, The New Cold War and Tribalism. The Destructive Dynamics of Political Tribalism. This doesn't sound good at all. That last article is by Amy Chua, who has a new book out right now called Political Tribalism, Group Instinct and the Fate of Nations. She argues that America's foreign policy has long been undermined by our underestimation of tribalism abroad, and that our domestic stability is now being hollowed out by our inability to see it clearly at home. This line of thinking connects with a lot of scholarship on democracy and polarization. There's another new book out now called How Democracies Die by Stephen Levisky and Daniel Ziblatt. This book is primarily about the way that several 20th century democracies in Europe and Latin America have degenerated and slipped into authoritarianism. And as part of their work, the authors document the increasing polarization of American political parties over the past 50 years, and especially the past 10 years, and the various ways this could threaten American democracy. In my circles, I follow a lot of people working on cognitive and social psychology that are studying our tribal psychology, for lack of a better term, the effects of human groupishness on our moral and epistemological thinking. And this work is starting to get noticed too, for obvious reasons. People want a deeper understanding of why this is happening and what, if anything, there is to be done about it. My own preoccupations with the relationship between critical thinking, argumentation, and persuasion have led me in and out of this literature on tribal psychology for years. Because the very same literature on cognitive biases and the evolutionary origins of our distinctively human ways of thinking also show up in the literature on tribalism. I think of it as part of the essential background knowledge for critical thinking understanding how our brains work, how we make judgments, how perception works, how emotions work, how successful communication works, how reasoning works, and so on. But now we have this new political context that is making this background relevant in a new way. So I thought, let's do a video series on tribalism and critical thinking. It does double duty. The tribal perspective sheds new light on the challenges of critical thinking and the critical thinking perspective, or rather the focus on the psychology and epistemology of rationality and belief, that adds some depth to the conversation about tribalism. And I wanted to do something that was visually more engaging, that combined words and images in a way that reflects how I tend to think of these topics. So I decided to use a sketchbook format. If you haven't seen them, the video shows me flipping through a sketchbook with drawings and narrating on top of this. I wanted to start out with a video that acknowledged the obvious point, the point that everyone is making, that tribalism is dangerous, that it can bring out the worst in human nature, and it can be politically and socially destabilizing. 
But one of my recurring themes is that tribalism per se isn't the real problem. The real problem is excessive polarization. So now I'm going to play the audio for that first video on the dangers of tribalism. There are a few places that the narration refers to a drawing, but for the most part, the audio can stand on its own. Let's listen to it and I'll add some commentary afterward. Hi, I'm Kevin Delplant, and this is the first in a series of sketchbook videos that I'm doing on tribalism and critical thinking. I believe that critical thinking in the 21st century demands a certain level of what I would call tribal literacy in order to understand what's going on in the world around us and ourselves, why we react to events the way we do, how we relate to other people. We need to understand how our tribal psychology influences the way we think and feel and make judgments. In this first video, I'm going to introduce some key definitions and talk about how polarization brings out the dark side, the dangerous side of tribalism. So what is tribalism? We'll start with what is a tribe. Basically, a tribe is a group of people that feel connected to each other in a meaningful way because they share something in common that matters to them. The connection can be based on just about anything, kinship, ethnicity, religion, language, culture, ideology, favorite sports team, whatever. What matters is that this connection binds individuals into a group that allows them to make a distinction between us, members of the group, and them, those who are not members of the group. Now, when we talk about tribalism, what we're really talking about is a pattern of attitudes and behaviors that human beings tend to adopt when we come to identify with our tribes. In a nutshell, we use the us-them distinction defined by tribal boundaries to make normative judgments. We're good, they're bad. We're right, they're wrong. We're worthy, they're unworthy. We're rational, they're irrational. Our beliefs are true, their beliefs are false. And these judgments support behaviors, how we act, what we say, how we respond, and so on. In other words, our moral psychology is very groupish. It follows the contours of our group affiliations. And it's not just our moral psychology. Our judgments about what's reasonable or unreasonable to believe, what arguments are persuasive, what sources are trustworthy, also follows the contours of our group affiliations. These are judgments about the character of our beliefs and our knowledge, what philosophers call epistemological judgments. If you're not familiar with this term, Epistemology is the name for the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. Epistemological is the adjectival form. It's a long word. It has seven syllables. Some people sometimes use the shorter term epistemic as the adjectival form. And these mean the same thing. An epistemic judgment is an epistemological judgment. They both mean that it's a judgment about what counts as knowledge or justified belief or how we come to have knowledge. So to parallel the claim that our moral psychology is groupish, we can say that our epistemic psychology is also groupish. And what's key is that these two kinds of groupishness are closely connected, at least in our psychology. If we're doing straight philosophy, we might have good reason to keep these two domains distinct, to not confound moral issues and epistemological issues. But if we're trying to understand human behavior, trying to figure out how human beings actually form judgments and make decisions, it turns out that we can't separate our moral psychology from our epistemic psychology. They both emerge from the same cognitive system. So our tribal psychology is both a moral psychology and an epistemic psychology. So that's tribalism. Now I want to note that tribalism per se isn't dangerous. I think it's clear that the dangers of tribalism are driven by polarization. So what's polarization? Polarization is a measure of the magnitude of the differences between groups. These differences can be almost anything. Physical traits, psychological traits, social traits, attitudes and behaviors. Polarization measures how large or strong those differences are. I'm interested in polarization as it relates to how we make moral judgments and how we make epistemic judgments. And in that case, perceived differences can be just as important as actual differences. Two groups may actually be more similar than they think, but if they perceive each other as more different, that can be enough to drive the attitudes and behaviors 
that characterize tribalism. Now, there's an obvious dark side to polarization. It's not hard to see how increasing polarization in our tribal psychology can lead to serious social and political problems and a distorted perception of the world. Here are two groups that are intermixed. They live and work together. I've drawn one as lighter green and the other as darker green. Let's assume that they disagree on some fundamental principles. They could be liberals and conservatives, Protestants and Catholics, vegetarians and non-vegetarians. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the character of the disagreement, how disagreement is interpreted and managed. On the right, I've got a polarization meter. It indicates how polarized these groups are. If it's in the green as it is here, that's a lower level of polarization. With lower levels of polarization, all other things being equal, there's more tolerance for disagreement. We recognize that in spite of our differences, there's still a great deal of common ground between us. And we can use that common ground as a basis for constructing a social space where we can live and work together peacefully. Our differences don't prevent us from being respectful and even friendly to one another. I see you as holding different views from me on some issues, and I may disagree with your reasons but I never question your capacity to reason or your entitlement to be treated like a human being worthy of respect and dignity. Now, as we ratchet up the polarization, it becomes increasingly difficult to manage these disagreements. With increasing polarization, we end up disagreeing on more things and we disagree more strongly. We care more about the issues on which we disagree and it becomes harder to accept disagreement as something we should just expect among reasonable people. It becomes harder for me to accept that your disagreement isn't a sign of a deeper flaw in your moral character or a deeper flaw in your capacity to see reality for what it is. As polarization increases, common ground decreases, which I'm visualizing here in terms of the degree of overlap and mixing in these groups. At the top, there's a lot of common ground and polarization is low. As you move down, our polarization meter runs into the yellow and it starts to become more challenging. At the bottom, polarization is in the red. It's becoming harder and harder to identify areas of agreement that we can use as a basis for adjudicating or negotiating differences in opinion. We interpret more of our differences as a reflection of incompatible worldviews. And then we hit a point where we feel an urge to separate. Peaceful coexistence between us seems impossible, and our instinct is to adapt by segregating, carving out social and political spaces where we don't have to interact with the other group, where we can enjoy the comforts of social interaction with our own kind, and the very real psychological benefits of unity and solidarity and the feeling of being a part of a collective identity. When this happens, polarization within each group drops back down to lower levels. Now, this may not sound so bad, but unfortunately, what often happens is that these very real psychological benefits are bought at a cost to our relationships with other groups. In-group solidarity tends to go up when the out-group, the group outside of us, is perceived in a negative light, as a dangerous other, as a threat to the unity and stability of our group. That threat is experienced as a kind of social pressure from the outside. And that pressure gets converted into social capital on the inside. Our capacity to organize ourselves and engage in coordinated social action as a group for the benefit of the group. Which can feel awesome and be very pleasant on the inside. But in our relations with other groups, it can lead to the worst behaviors of which human beings are capable. Prejudice, discrimination, violence, atrocity, genocide. And even if we don't get to the point of violence, if our laws and institutions are strong enough to prevent that, we're still left with a public culture where our in-group, out-group relationships are dominated by suspicion, hostility, and fear. And another casualty of extreme polarization is epistemic. When we cut ourselves off from other points of view, and only look to our tribe for guidance on what to believe and who to trust, we run the risk of erecting a system of beliefs that is increasingly unmoored from reality. The moral and political bubble that we've built for ourselves is also an epistemic bubble. Everyone outside the bubble is biased or lying or irrational or otherwise untrustworthy. 
And this is obviously a disaster for critical thinking. I think it's also obvious that our public culture is drifting in this direction. And in some areas, like our public political discourse, it has become toxic. The first lesson I would draw from this is that the problem isn't our tribal psychology per se. Low to moderate levels of polarization can be very good for us. We get the benefits of community and belonging and group solidarity without the disruption and risks that come with higher levels of polarization. The real problem is polarization and the forces that are responsible for driving us in the direction of increasing polarization. Now, in this respect, our tribal psychology is part of the problem because some of the forces that drive polarization do have roots in our psychology. There are feedback loops that can be triggered that contribute to the escalation. But they're not the only forces. There are external social forces that are in play as well, like orchestrated persuasion campaigns and persuasion technologies created by governments and corporations that are designed to exploit these feedback loops, to exploit the mechanisms that feed polarization. And there are broader social trends in technology and lifestyle and geopolitical tensions that I think exacerbate the problem. In the other videos in this series, my plan is to shine a light on this problem from a number of different perspectives. I think we need to understand all of these issues better if we're going to have a productive conversation about what we want to do about this situation. Hey, thanks for watching. When I was a university teacher, I used to draw a lot in the classroom, and I find that I really miss that experience, so this was a lot of fun for me. If you would like to learn more about the research that informed this video, there's a link in the description below to a blog post over on kevindelplant.com, so please check that out if you're interested. And we are back. There are some graphics in this video that I think really do help to sell the message, so I do recommend you check out the video if you haven't already. Now one thing I do when I make a video like this that is intended to be very accessible is that I don't spend a lot of time talking about references or making the sorts of qualifications that you might writing for an academic audience say. But those references are important and when I'm doing my research, I collect them. They become part of my personal background knowledge. One thing I've come to realize about research on tribalism and tribal psychology is that the phenomenon itself cuts across disciplinary boundaries and different disciplines focus on some aspects but not others. So to get a fuller picture, you really need to survey these different disciplines. For example, social psychologists can study in-group, out-group biases without knowing anything about the neurobiology of us-them thinking. And you can study both without knowing anything about the evolution of human sociality or debates over group selection in evolutionary theory. And you can learn all of this and not be familiar with work on the psychology and physiology of belongingness and all the documented correlations there are between physical and mental health benefits and healthy group identities or social isolation and the epidemic of loneliness. You can keep extending this list. You can know all about what I just mentioned and not be familiar with the research that political scientists have done on tribalism and polarization, how polarization is measured, and what theories have been discussed to explain the steady rise in polarization that we've seen, in the American context at least, over the past 40 years. Now from my perspective, one of the advantages of being a philosopher of science studying this work, and not a psychologist, or an evolutionary biologist, or a political scientist, is that I don't have a disciplinary home in any of these fields, so I don't feel any pressure to stay close to home. It makes it easier to step back and try to visualize the whole elephant, as it were. Anyway, let's move on to the second video, which is on tribal epistemology, in which I titled Our Tribal Intelligence. Now, tribal epistemology is itself another one of these cluster concepts that you can decompose into a large number of distinct phenomena that are studied by different disciplines. In this video, I wanted to set the stage for discussions that are coming farther down the line. I wanted to talk about the evolution of human groupishness and at least one topic that connects strongly to human evolutionary biology, which is the evolution of culture and the role that culture plays in our success as a species. Anyone familiar with Joe Henrik's work on the coevolution of the human genome and human culture will see his influence in this video. 
This video also calls back to an earlier video I did on the knowledge illusion, or what is otherwise known as the illusion of explanatory depth, which is discussed at length in Stephen Sloman and Phil Fernbach's book, The Knowledge Illusion. So here's the audio portion of our tribal intelligence. I'll add some comments afterward. In the movie, The Matrix, Keanu Reeves is able to learn new knowledge and skills by downloading information directly into his brain. This information is stored in computer networks, but when he needs it, he can tap into it. The movie may be science fiction, but there's an important grain of truth to this picture. Most of our knowledge and skills isn't stored inside our heads. It's stored outside of our heads, in the people and artifacts and institutions that make up our culture. Hi, I'm Kevin Delaplante, and this is the second video in a series I'm doing on the theme of critical thinking and tribalism. In the first video, I talked about the dangers of tribalism, which is very important, but I think we also need to understand some of the virtues of tribalism, how we benefit from our tribal nature. So in this video, I talk about how our distinctive human intelligence is actually a product of our tribal nature. Individually, we're not well adapted for survival. We're adapted for survival in groups. Our groupishness is the key to our success as a species. At some point in our evolutionary history, there was a turn towards social survival strategies. And these social strategies became a part of the environmental context in which natural selection and other evolutionary forces operated. And in particular, this is the context in which our distinctively human brains evolved. For example, we know that prehistoric humans were among the most successful hunters in the history of the world. Ancient humans killed everything, including the biggest animals. Mammoths, elephants, rhinoceroses, bison. We were so good at it, we drove many of these animals to extinction. And we know that the hunt was often a communal affair that could involve dozens of participants, and that it involved a level of cooperation and a division of labor that was unique to humans. For the bison hunt, for example, some had to be experts on bison behavior. Some were responsible for driving the bison along a prescribed route. Some waited at a trap location to kill the animal. The whole thing had to be carefully orchestrated. And then they had to process the meat. Imagine killing half a dozen bison, each weighing 3,500 pounds, and having to butcher and preserve the meat so that the tribe could safely eat it weeks and months in the future. What makes all of this possible is not just a division of physical labor. What makes it possible is a division of cognitive labor. Each member of the community had to master a skill that contributed to achieving the community's goals. Some were responsible for wielding the spears and killing the animals. Others were responsible for making fire, others for butchering. Now, in each of these, individual humans needed to be intelligent to do their jobs. But individual intelligence wasn't responsible for the success of ancient humans. It was collective intelligence that was responsible for their success. The ability to pursue common goals as a group and coordinate individual actions to fulfill those goals. That same capacity for collective intelligence is responsible for much of the world we see around us. Think of all the different trades that are required to build a modern home. Surveyors, excavators, framers, bricklayers, roofers, plumbers, carpenters, painters, electricians, landscapers. Large building projects have always involved a sophisticated division of cognitive labor. The broader point is that human social life requires a sophisticated division of cognitive labor. And this fact had a profound effect on the evolution of the human brain and other key features of human psychology. Modern humans emerge about 200,000 years ago, and they stand out because of their large brains, roughly three times the size of our early hominid ancestors. There's a long history of speculation and debate over what caused this increase in brain size, but one of the key drivers was certainly the cognitive demand of our communal social life. As human social groups increase in size and complexity, there are greater demands for communication and the ability to understand and incorporate the perspectives of other people and to share common goals. This sets up conditions for the evolution of language as a tool for making it easier to share goals and intentions. It also sets up conditions for developing internal models of the intentions of other people and the ability to reason about those intentions. If you're looking at a bison and aiming your bow and arrow at it, I have to be able to infer that your intention is to shoot the bison with the intention of killing it. Being able to reason about other people's mental states 
is a critical talent for working together in large groups. A consequence of this collaborative mode of living is that human beings evolved a collective intelligence that is unique as far as we know. Now, as we said, this collective intelligence requires certain abilities of individuals. First, we need to be able to share our attention. When a group of us is crouching in the grass waiting for the bison to come, our attention is focused on the same thing, the same aspect of our sensory experience. And we know that we're attending to the same thing. I know that about you and you know that about me. We need to be able to share our attention in order to coordinate our actions. Now, once we can share our attention, then we can share knowledge about the thing that we're attending to. We can talk about common knowledge, the knowledge that is shared within the community about something. There are things that we know about the bison and the bison hunt that everyone in the community knows in virtue of participating in this shared collective action. And once we've got shared attention and shared knowledge, we can have shared goals, shared intentions. We can formulate plans and strategies that we intend to pursue together. And we can collaborate. Our brains have evolved to facilitate collaboration. Our brain and hormonal activity become synchronized when we collaborate. We take pleasure in engaging with others in shared activities. We're hardwired for it. Now, with these features in place, we have the infrastructure for the next big step, which is the ability to store and transmit knowledge, collective knowledge, from one generation to the next. A unique form of culture appears in our evolutionary lineage. A culture that functions as a repository of our collective knowledge and skills that we can add to over time and that accumulates over time. Learn a new skill, a new way of doing something, and that knowledge can be shared, stored, and transmitted through cultural practices so that it can be replicated and accessed by future generations. I rather like this metaphor of uploading skills and knowledge to the culture cloud so that we can access it at different places and times when we need it. In fact, the digital cloud that we're all familiar with is literally a part of this broader culture cloud. Most of our social learning is mediated by accessing information stored in the culture cloud. That's how we learn to read and write, for example. We're born with brains and bodies that have the capacity to read and write, but the actual skill of reading and writing is acquired by accessing knowledge that is stored in our culture, not in our genes. I like this cartoon by Randy Glassbergen. It's called Reading. It's how people install new software into their brains. It's funny, but it's also true. If we think of reading a book as a way of accessing information that is stored outside our brains, stored in the culture cloud. We are a uniquely intelligent species, but the way we make ourselves intelligent is what makes us special. We make ourselves intelligent by distributing our skills and knowledge throughout the community, in the minds of individuals, but also in our tools and artifacts and institutions. This stored cultural knowledge far exceeds what any individual human being can know, and it continues to grow and develop over time. Our genius as a species, the secret of our success, to use Joe Henrik's phrase, is that we can tap into this stored knowledge when it's needed, and we can use it to coordinate the complex tasks we engage in. It's what makes those distinctively human complex tasks possible. Now, it's not always obvious to us that our knowledge is socially distributed and accessed in this way. In fact, it's very easy for us to confuse our personal knowledge what we actually carry around in our heads, what we can articulate if asked to, with our culturally accessed knowledge, which we don't carry around in our heads. So, for example, we have a strong tendency to think we know more about the world than we can actually articulate on our own. To use an example that I've talked about in another video, if I ask you, do you know how a bicycle works? You'll be pretty confident that you do. But if I ask you to explain how a functional bicycle works, or to sketch a functioning bicycle on a piece of paper, Research shows that less than half of you will be able to do it without making mistakes. These are real drawings by real people, by the way. None of these depict a bike that would actually function. And many of you will be genuinely surprised at how hard this task was for you, how much you overestimated the depth of your personal knowledge. There are many different ways that human beings overestimate their personal knowledge. The one that I'm talking about here is known in the cognitive bias literature as the illusion of explanatory depth, or the knowledge illusion. The original research on this focused on our knowledge of devices that we're familiar with, like bicycles and zippers and, and flush toilets. But the effect shows up everywhere in our knowledge of just about 
anything that isn't directly within our area of personal expertise. What is compound interest? What is it? GMO. What are the parts of an atom? How does the greenhouse effect work? What are the signs and symptoms of depression? Our actual ability to give good answers to these questions is far below what we believe it to be. But our vulnerability to the knowledge illusion isn't so surprising if the story about the social character of our knowledge is right. Our brains just weren't designed to represent all of our knowledge in detail. Most of the time, what matters for our daily tasks is whether we can access the information that is stored outside of our brains, in the environment, in the community, in the culture, when we need it. We do this so naturally, so automatically, that we don't even realize it's what we're doing. So it's not surprising that for most things, the personal knowledge we carry around in our brains is sketchy and incomplete. It doesn't have to be complete if we have ready access to our cultural matrix of knowledge. But as we've seen, there is a downside to relying on this form of socially distributed knowledge. We routinely overestimate the depth of our personal knowledge. And that's a problem because it makes us overconfident about what we know. And many cognitive tasks really do require a certain depth of personal knowledge. Studies show, for example, that about 40% of Americans don't actually know what compound interest is. But most of those 40% think they know. They only discover that they don't really understand the concept when they're actually asked to articulate it. This matters because in most countries, we haven't solved the problem of automating management of personal debt or financial planning for retirement. So this deficit in our personal knowledge has real consequences. So I don't want to say that we shouldn't bother developing our personal knowledge. There are lots of reasons to do this, not the least of which is that it's essential to developing fundamental critical thinking skills. But I also think that if we take seriously this notion of collective social intelligence that is stored in the minds of individuals distributed across the community and in our cultural artifacts and institutions, then we should be spending more time thinking about ways that we can all benefit from this tribal intelligence. How to make it easier for individuals to both access and add to the intelligence stored in the culture cloud. How to most effectively use this intelligence to solve our collective problems. From a philosophy perspective, I think it's very interesting to think about the interplay between personal knowledge, the epistemology of individual knowers, and social knowledge, the epistemology of social groups. So in the next video in this series, I'm gonna focus on a particular aspect of this interplay, which is about how human beings make judgments about what sources of information are reliable or trustworthy, and to what extent these are tribal judgments. And we are back again. Okay, I have a couple of comments to make about this video. The first is that it illustrates a recurring theme in research on cognitive biases, which is that these biases are grounded in cognitive shortcuts or heuristics that are generally adaptive in a wide range of contexts. They're a feature of our design. They're not a bug, but they can and do have negative effects. And we want to minimize these effects when we can. Now, when it comes to overconfidence biases, like the illusion of explanatory depth, there is no easy debiasing strategy that can reduce the first order effect. In most cases, our fast automatic judgments of how much we understand about a particular topic are going to be too high. We'll overestimate how well we know what we think we know and underestimate how much we don't know. But what we can do is cultivate a second order attitude toward our first order judgments, namely that we should be skeptical of our first order judgments. This is an example of what is sometimes called metacognition, thinking about thinking. Part of critical thinking is acquiring the right kinds of metacognitive habits of thought that will promote our critical thinking goals rather than inhibit them. And one important class of such habits of thought is our attitudes toward our own cognitive limitations. If someone asks me whether I think tighter gun control laws will be effective at reducing the number of mass shootings, I'm going to have an initial judgment about that, especially if I'm familiar with the general opinion of the leaders in my social tribe on this topic. But unless you're an actual social scientist who has studied the empirical data on this or have made a serious commitment to acquiring a diverse background on the relevant social science, 
that initial judgment will be way overconfident. What the research on this cognitive bias shows is that if you're asked to actually explain the mechanism, give the causal story of how a change in the law will ultimately impact rates of mass shootings, you will struggle to assemble a coherent story about that. And your degree of confidence in your own understanding will drop as a result. That's the effect we see over and over in experimental studies. So my second order habit of thought should be to acknowledge this fact that my understanding of this topic is shallower and less complete than I think it is and act accordingly. Now, what does it mean to act accordingly? Well, it depends on the situation. At the very least, it means acting from a position of epistemic humility. Like if I generally lean pro-gun control, it could mean simply saying, I don't really know. I'm inclined to think it'll have some impact, but how much, I don't know. Or if I generally lean the other way, I might say, I don't really know. I'm inclined to think it won't have much effect, but I could be wrong about that. Now, this kind of measured, cautious response may not curry you any favors if your social tribe is a partisan tribe that has a more confident view on this, because there are strong incentives to signal your membership in the tribe by adopting a view that matches that confidence. But it is the more intellectually honest and honorable response, I believe, once you're aware of the biases in your own thinking. Okay, that was the first point I wanted to raise about this video. The second point is on a different topic. It's about collective intelligence. This is another area where you find disciplinary expertise in unexpected areas. I read a lot of social psychology. I read a lot about IQ and the debates over how to interpret IQ scores. But from that crew, you rarely encounter anyone talking about collective intelligence. The people who are doing the most interesting research on collective intelligence are academics working in business departments at the intersection between psychology, business management, and organizational performance. These are the people studying the features of successful teams and the cognitive and personality traits of individuals who comprise successful teams with respect to problem solving, innovation, planning, consensus finding, and so on. And it shouldn't be a surprise to learn that if you stack a team full of high IQ academic overachievers, they won't do as well as a team with a better distribution of social, emotional, and communication skills. The skill set that promotes high functioning groups is not the same as the skill set for high functioning individuals. And when you think about how important teamwork and collaboration are in modern work environments, it would be nice if this fact was more widely appreciated in public education circles. In business, it's all over the place. But I don't think our schools are teaching students about the psychology of effective teamwork or designing curricula to foster these kinds of skills. And that seems like a missed opportunity to me. Anyway, I could go on, but I think that's enough for now. So I'm going to wrap up here. Hey, thanks again for listening. You can see the show notes for this episode at kevindolaplante.com or at argumentninja.com. Just look for episode 25 of the podcast. I'm going to post this, and then I'm going to get to work on the next video in the tribalism series, which will focus on the way that our tribal nature influences our judgments about who counts as an expert and what sources of information are trustworthy, which is a very timely topic. So stay tuned for that. If you find this podcast and these videos valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can subscribe to the Argument Ninja podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can watch and share the videos on social media, or you can support my work directly by becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash Kevin Delaplante. My goal is to be fully funded from monthly supporters so I can devote myself fully to creating new critical thinking resources including the Argument Ninja Academy. But I'm not there yet. So until that happens, I'm forced to do other kinds of work to make ends meet, which makes it harder to produce new content like this on a regular schedule. So if you'd like to see more content on a more frequent schedule, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. And just a reminder, for as little as $3 a month, you also get access to all the video tutorial content over at criticalthinkeracademy.com. I have video courses there 
on basic concepts in logic and argumentation, logical fallacies, cognitive biases, argumentative essay writing, and much more. You get access to all of that content when you sign up as a recurring monthly supporter. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.